Go ahead and open your Bibles once again to the book of Zephaniah. We'll look at the final portion of this prophecy, chapter 3, verses 14 through 20, at this incredible joy that will one day characterize the day of the Lord. But first, I want to read some statistics some statistics on depression. Uh, These are all having to do with uh, depression in America. And one thing that is abundantly clear from these statistics is that we are a sad, sad people. 17.3 million adults, that's just over 7% of the population, have had at least one major depressive episode, says the National Institute of Mental Health. Of those with major depressive episodes, 63.8% of adults and almost 71% of adolescents had severe impairment, what's considered severe impairment because of those episodes. Adolescents aged 12 to 17 years old had the highest rate of major depressive episodes, uh, almost 14.5%, followed by young adults, 18 to 25, just over or almost 14%. Severe depression among college students rose from 9.4 to 21% between the years 2013 and 2018. The rate of moderate to severe depression rose from 23.2% to 41%. 0.1% from 2007 to 2018, and of those diagnosed with depression, 1% of women and 7% of men committed suicide. So we live in a world that is increasingly immoral and also increasingly sad, not surprising to people who believe their Bibles. And you just, as an aside, you would have to wonder if we're making such medical advancements, supposedly, in the areas of psychology and psychiatry, then why in the world are we increasing in these kind of statistics? Perhaps we should reconsider the success or the usefulness of such medications or such systems of counsel. Now, what's worse than being consistently intensely melancholy is feeling consistently intensely melancholy and not knowing what to do about it. That is a hopeless state indeed. And to have no answers to the sadness that plagues you, to see no way out of that sadness and no day when joy will finally come is certainly a hopeless state. Arthur Pink says that every doctrine of the gospel and every attribute of God is enough to make the heart sing. And in this passage today, we will see that very thing, truths that will not only compel the heart to sing, but even are good grounds for what we see in the beginning of this passage, commands to be joyful, to shout, to rejoice. Turn your attention to Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 14. And follow along as I read. The prophet says, Shout for joy, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. Yahweh has taken away his judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The king of Israel, Yahweh, is in your midst. You will fear disaster no more. In that day, it will be said to Jerusalem, do not be afraid, O Zion. Do not let your hands fall limp. Yahweh your God is in your midst, a victorious warrior. He will exult over you with joy. He will quiet you in his love. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. I will gather those who grieve about the appointed feasts. They came from you, O Zion. 
The reproach of exile is a burden on them. Behold, I am going to deal at that time with all your oppressors. I will save the lame and gather the outcast, and I will return their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you in, even at that time, at the time when I gather you together. Indeed, I will give you renown and praise among all the peoples of the earth. When I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says Yahweh. This is an incredible prophecy and indeed even a stark contrast from what we've seen so far. Uh, For much of this prophecy, it has been doom and gloom, a prediction of wrath and devastation on the earth and those who are left in this day of the Lord. But here is something altogether different. There is no longer cause for lamentation, but only joy forever. This is the moment that we've all been waiting for. This is what every believing Israelite would have anticipated. This has been a time predicted from the beginning of the writings of Scripture from Moses. And here it's predicted again by Zephaniah, a day that God's people still anxiously await. What we have unfolding for us in this passage are five feats facilitating fervent felicity. Five feats facilitating fervent felicity. These feats, these five accomplishments, actually produce, they are the grounds for, they are the occasions for fervent felicity or intense joy. And that's clear from the beginning of the passage, verse 14. We have here compounded four commands for imperatives to really do the same thing. Four verbs that all communicate to express intense joy. In the English, these get translated shout for joy, shout, rejoice, and exult. Zephaniah is grasping for words to tell his audience this is an occasion where there's only one appropriate response. Rejoice. Be glad. Intensely so. And so he gives us four different words to communicate that. He's running out of language for what to do. And really that communicates the intensity, uh, the eagerness behind this occasion, just the appropriateness that everything he's about to describe calls for. Just notice in verse 14, to whom these things are addressed. You have three synonyms for the audience to whom these commands come. They are the daughter of Zion, Israel, and the daughter of Jerusalem. All three of these terms, daughter of or even Israel, uh, that has to do with the inhabitants of these places. Zion would have been the Uh, elevated mountain on which Jerusalem uh, sat, and then you get Israel and the O daughter of Jerusalem as well. So you have really the people dwelling in Zion, Israel, Jerusalem. Now, if you remember, this letter has come to the southern tribe uh, of, of Judah, not Israel and the divided nation, but here you get this address even to Israel, uh, this will be appropriate under a united nation once again. And it's the place where God determined that his glory would be most prominently displayed forever. And that is Jerusalem or Zion. That is the uh, place from which a few of us just came to, to sit Uh, just a few days ago, to stand on the Mount of Olives, uh, looking at the Temple Mount, where Jerusalem sat, (laughs) 
we're, we're looking at the city, and then just to think about this passage when this kind of joy would be appropriate. Today, that is not the case. We uh, walk through the streets of Jerusalem, upstream from many Muslims, going to the Temple Mount, to the Dome of the Rock. They are not rejoicing, the Jews, to hear Muslim prayers uh, blasted across the whole city where Solomon built the temple originally. That is not an occasion for rejoicing. It's an offense. Uh, It's a a blasphemous practice to the Jews. And so this day clearly has not yet come. One day it will. So we have five feats facilitating fervent felicity. The first of those is, number one, the completion of God's judgment. The completion of God's judgment. Verse 15, Yahweh has taken away his judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies, the king of Israel. Yahweh is in your midst. You will fear disaster no more. The first of these feats is that God has cleared away his judgments. And like this first feat, all of the rest are the same. They are things that God himself is accomplishing among his people. No one else gets credit for these things. No one else is responsible except God alone. These are acts of grace when God has unilaterally accomplished these things on behalf of his people, the first of them to be clearing away his judgments. What are these judgments? Again, you just need to stay in the the close context. We've been hearing about these intense judgments from the opening of the book when God removes or destroys, really obliterates the entire earth and successive judgments coming upon the earth and those who still dwell on it. We've been reading about this from the beginning of this prophecy. He is undoing creation. There is a call for silence and sorrow, this wailing or lamentation that's been happening during these judgments. Well, here, God has taken those away. He has completed them. His wrath has been unleashed all the way to the finish, to the end of it, and now we're turning a corner, and it's a new day. It's the same day, but a new day on the same day, the day of the Lord, where now no more lamentation and sorrow, but now rejoicing for for one reason, that the judgments have actually been finished. Now, you remember that these judgments have been uh, seen in a couple different ways. They've been against Israel, particularly. The judgments have come. Israel, up to this day, refuses to obey Yahweh, refuses to embrace her Messiah as a nation, refuses to repent. And so these judgments have come against Israel because they have not believed and have not feared their God. But then these uh, judgments have also come against the world generally. So as Israel has experienced the destruction, so has the rest of the world. All of creation has been touched by these judgments. Every nation has been destroyed, has been affected by these judgments. And so now there's a call for intense joy, fervent felicity, because, number one, they're over. The judgments are no more. And so along with Israel particularly, the rest of the world generally has cause for rejoicing. And so these calls for felicity, for joy, are commanded. The second feat facilitating fervent felicity is, number two, the removal of of Israel's enemies, the removal of Israel's enemies. Notice in verse 15, just as surely as the judgments are taken away, so are the enemies. He has cleared away your enemies. He has cleared away your enemies. This, uh, again, was another facet of what we saw uh, being in Israel recently. You can stand on numerous high places, numerous mountains in Israel, and just look and see the areas where their enemies are dwelling, even in their midst currently. 
Uh, you can see Jordanians, Lebanon, Syria, and they are literally surrounded by people who hate them, would love for nothing more than to remove every Jew and the remembrance of the Jews from out of history, to take away their nation from off the map. And really the only thing keeping them there is God and his love for them, his providence to sustain them in the midst of enemies all around and in their midst, like a, a flame underwater, Israel is sustained amidst their enemies. One day, that will no longer be the case. He will clear them away. He will do away with everyone who takes issue with Israel. Notice the king of Israel, when this happens, the king of Israel, that is Yahweh himself, will be in your midst, in the midst of Israel. And here we have this repeated phrase, in your midst, in your midst, in your midst. Just look at uh, verse 3 of chapter 3. You have in your midst used her princes within her or in her midst are roaring lions. Uh, You remember at the time that Zephaniah is prophesying this, He specifically mentions rulers of Israel. They were in their midst, spread out in the presence of the people, oppressing the people and doing their injustice. Again, you have verse 5. Yahweh is righteous within her, in her midst, is that same phrase. He's not doing injustice, unlike their leaders. But he was in their midst righteous, unlike the people around. This was a cause of grief for the people that God, even though he was righteous, he was bringing justice to light, probably a reference to the prophets continually prophesying, calling the people to repent. So they were able to see God's righteousness, but in an unrighteous nation. And then again in verse 11, For then I will remove from your midst, from within you, from within you, from within your midst, your proud, exalting ones, and you will never again be haughty on my holy mountain. So this is the the turn. This is a time unlike the time that Zephaniah and the other prophets prophesied when Yahweh would be in their midst, but then he would dwell as the righteous one in the midst of a righteous, humble people because the proud ones among them would be removed from their midst. And then again, you have the same phrase used in verse 12. But I will leave among you a humble and lowly people, and they will take refuge in the name of Yahweh. That among you is, again, the same phrase in the Hebrew, in your midst. The proud exalting ones will be removed from them, from the midst of them, the humble ones will be left in their midst. And then Yahweh himself, as we see in verse 15, their king would dwell in their midst. So the righteous one would dwell amongst a righteous people as their king. And along with this, you will fear disaster no more. So the removal of Israel's enemies has happened. There's no cause for oppression from people who hate them. There's no need for a military, (laughs) other prophets predict, because they will have no enemies. They will have no one who would seek to do them harm. And this, of course, would be a cause of great rejoicing. This is the grounds of the joy that's called for. The completion of God's judgments, the removal of Israel's enemies. You'll even remember from chapter 2, the the bulk of chapter 2 predicted a time when every nation to the north, west, east, south would be destroyed by God. This is the fulfillment of that day. So the Philistines, the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Ethiopians, the Assyrians, all of these nations who hate Israel would be done away with 
by the time this phase of the day of the Lord arrives. These re- the removal of Israel's enemies, are the, the removal is specific, it's decisive, and it's eternal. Uh, this decisive removal, a time when for sure it would be evident that they had no enemies, and then forever, it's, it's, it's an eternal removal of their enemies. This removal of their enemies, you see clearly, is accompanied by another feat for which joy is the proper response. It's number three, the return of Israel's king. The return of Israel's king. The king of Israel, Yahweh, is in your midst. This this can't be said today in the way that God intended this to be said. Uh, Even in Zephaniah's day when the temple still stood, when the Ark of the Covenant uh, was remaining in the temple and God was still, although displeased with his people, pleased to let his presence dwell there. Uh, they were exiled, of course, to Babylon eventually in 586. They returned to the land after 70 years of exile. The temple, a less glorious temple, was rebuilt. Jerusalem was reestablished as a nation. 400 years of silence followed. The king came. He was rejected by his people. He was crucified at the hands of the Jews and the Romans, all by God's sovereign will. And then he left. He ascended. And he is not in Jerusalem anymore. Still, this day is an anticipation of the return of Israel's king. For some 2,000 years almost, he has not dwelled comfortably in Jerusalem. And so for the king of Israel, Yahweh, to be in their midst, this is indeed his return. Uh, His person is present and his rule is evident on this day. His person is present in the person of Jesus. His rule is evident as he rules in their midst, and even what we'll see in verse 17, just look at verse 17. Yahweh your God, again, is in your midst as what? A victorious warrior? He will exalt over you. So the exaltation that's called for in verse 14 from the people is matched by God himself. They're joyous, he's joyous. He's righteous, they're righteous. This day is coming. Do you anticipate this day? Do you look forward to this day? Are you certain that you will see this day? Because when all the proud people, too proud of heart to trust God, are removed, you will remain because you humbly trust God. This is a return of Israel's king. Fourthly, marvelously, This is also the establishment of Israel's peace. The establishment of Israel's peace. Verses 15 through 17 document that for us. Israel has their peace finally established. One reason we've already seen why this peace is established is because he's cleared away their enemies. The king himself has come and done away with everybody who hates his people. But just notice the character of the peace that will one day be present. Verse 15, you will fear disaster no more. You will fear disaster no more. Or the way I'd I'd like to translate this, you will fear no evil again. You will fear no evil again. Uh, It could be translated fairly that way. You will fear no evil again. Does that sound familiar? You will fear no evil or I will fear no evil. I think Zephaniah is intentionally picking up on the language because the construction is the exact same in the Hebrew except for one difference that the first person where this was first stated is actually 
stated here with the second person, uh, a reference to Israel. So instead of I, it's you. But the I will fear no evil is written by David in Psalm 23. Just go back to Psalm 23. And you'll see what David said about his shepherd. David was resolved to not be afraid for a similar reason that Israel is told that she will not be afraid on this future day. Just look at Psalm 23, verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, David says, I fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. God's presence, specifically the angel of the Lord, the angel of Yahweh, Yahweh himself, who is David's shepherd, just like this same angel who is Yahweh himself, was Jacob's shepherd. And every believer of subsequent generations, this messenger of the Lord, this one who is the messenger of Yahweh, who is Yahweh, who speaks for God, who speaks as God, he is the one who shepherds or leads and cares for God's people. Because of his presence, David says, for you are with me, he says, I fear no evil. I will not fear. Well, David's convinced that he will fear no evil. He's resolved to not be afraid, to fear no evil, to fear no disaster because of the presence of this one. Because of the presence of Yahweh, Because of the presence of Yahweh, who is his shepherd, David says, I fear no evil. Well, Zephaniah predicts, foretells of a day when the king of Israel, Yahweh, the shepherd of Israel, dwells comfortably in the midst of his people. And because of his presence, Zephaniah predicts, Israel tells Israel, you will fear evil no more. You will fear disaster no more. It's the same word. David's resolve will one day be Israel's reality. No more fear because of the presence of this king, this shepherd. This day is coming. So the character of Israel's peace that Yahweh himself establishes one day is David-like. And it's also certain. Just notice the certainty of everything that we've read so so far. This day, Yahweh has taken away that anticipation of the completion of God's judgments. Well, that's certain. It's certainly coming. The judgments are certainly coming. You remember that day is coming. It's near. It's coming swiftly. Like chaff, the day passes. And what else is certain is the removal of Israel's enemies. He has cleared away your enemies on that day. And then as certain as the completion of God's judgments and the removal of Israel's enemies is the peace of Israel. You will fear disaster no more. There's no question. It's certain. It's coming. Wait for it. We saw it in verse 8 of chapter 3. Wait for me. Yahweh will act. This is coming. You will fear disaster no more. And the no more implies, indicates that it's an enduring peace. It's an enduring peace. The peace matches that of David. The peace is certain, and the peace is enduring. Once this peace is established by the removal of Israel's enemies, by the completion of God's judgments against them, then never again will there be a cause for fear in Israel. You will fear evil no more. Never again. God will always be with you. He will always be at peace with you. You will be forever reconciled to him. And so for those reasons, there's never again a cause for fear. 
No anxiety disorders to be found in Israel. No more uh, anxiety labels or even the temptation to be anxious. These are all gone. The people are confident in their king on this day. The establishment of Israel's peace, uh, here we see not only the character of their peace, but also the character of their God, the God who comes to them and dwells comfortably in their midst, this righteous one. Just look at his character described in verse 17. Yahweh, your God, this is their God. He is in their midst. He is present and present as what? Well, a victorious warrior. The character of this one is that he is mighty to save. If you want to know how Israel is going to finally have peace, it will not ultimately come by the power of political advocates, political maneuvers, treaties. No, the way they will finally have peace is when their king, our king, finally subdues their enemies. This is peace through superior firepower. He will put down their enemies and then they will have peace. He is not only a, a victorious warrior, mighty to save, but he is abundant in joy. God himself is abundant in joy according to this passage. Verse 17, he will exalt over you with joy. So just notice verse 14, they're called to shout for joy. They're called at the end of that to exalt with all their heart. And here the king is said to do the very same thing about them. He is exalting mightily over them. He is exalting over them with joy. God himself. And just imagine what that's going to be like. God the king, personally present amidst his people, exulting over them with great joy. Do you, do, you, do you know what it would be like? Do you envision, can you imagine God himself rejoicing with great joy? even over those who believe. That includes you, Christian. Those whom he has rescued from his wrath and then come to dwell in the midst of a humble people, if that, by God's grace, describes you, then one day this will be true of you. He will exalt over you with joy. Even the next statement Uh, He will be quiet in his love. That's a literally could be uh, translated. He will quiet in his love. And then translators wrestle with, well, who's who's he quieting? Who is he causing to be quiet? Is that himself? He's causing himself to be quiet or he's causing others to be quiet. And that accounts for the difference in translation. I think the better translation is that he will quiet you. Just notice the the parallelism in these statements. If the first statement, he will exalt with joy, is over you. And then the, the last statement in verse 17, he will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. God's the actor, and he's acting on his people. Or his people are the recipients of his actions. So the exaltation is over you. And the quieting is done to you, and the rejoicing is over you. So as people are the recipients, I think, of each of these actions. And so who's caused to be quiet in God's love? It's his people. So amazing is this scene. So incredible is God's joy his expressions of joy over his people that his people are left awestruck, just speechless. 
as God rejoices mightily over them. Even the, the third line, the last, the last line in verse 17, he will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. That's a reference to, to even singing. The, the shouts there are something like melodious <laughs> expressions of joy. And so what you have in view is God exultant over his people, even to the point of bursting forth in song. So you have God singing in joy over his people, shouting, boisterous uh, melody coming from God himself, the king, amidst his people. And so you just have to ask yourself, does God actually sing? You know, amongst all of the thoughts you have of God and all of your great profound theology, perhaps, Do you have a category for God singing loudly, even singing loudly about the greatness of God? I hope you have that category because it's a biblical one. Let me just show you a couple places where this is so clear. Turn to Mark 14. Mark chapter 14, verse 26, we have God himself singing. amidst his people. Just a passing statement, almost a throwaway statement by Mark. I'm sure you've read this before. Mark chapter 14, verse 26 says of Jesus, after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. That's not even the point. The point is they went out to the Mount of Olives, but Mark carefully, thankfully notes They did that after singing a hymn. Jesus, with his disciples at the Last Supper, he sang with them, probably led them in singing. So they sang together. And let me just show you one other reference where this same God is said to sing amongst or in the midst of his people, Hebrews 2. Hebrews chapter 2 And you'll notice in both of these contexts, the kingdom is being anticipated. Uh, Zephaniah 3, a a description of the kingdom. In Mark 14, Jesus has longed to take this last meal and uh, to institute the Lord's table as he anticipates the kingdom in that context. And then here again, This ultimate salvation, this kingdom that is coming, is what the writer consistently anticipates in Hebrews. But here again, just notice verse 10 for it was fitting for him for whom all things are, for whom are all things, and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified, that is Jesus and his people, are all from one source or one father, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them, that is those who are sanctified, he's not ashamed to call them brethren. Jesus is not ashamed to call you, believer, brother. If he has saved you, If God has elected you and granted you the gift of faith, if you are one who is sanctified positionally and who is being sanctified progressively, practically, then Jesus is not ashamed to call you brethren. That's what this passage says. And look what else he says. As he unashamedly embraces his brethren, verse 12, these are the words of Jesus saying, I will proclaim your name to my brethren in the midst, same phrase, of the congregation, I, Jesus, will sing your praise. Talking about God. Well, when is that? That's what Zephaniah is anticipating. 
a day when Jesus, the King of Israel, Yahweh himself, is personally present, singing the praises of God in joy amongst his people. Just notice verse 13, still Hebrews 2. And again, Jesus says, I will put my trust in him. God is the God of Jesus. Jesus trusts God with a whole heart. But not only does Jesus trust God, verse 13 says, and again, behold, I will put my trust in him and the children whom God has given me. The children share with Jesus a trust, a wholehearted trust in God. And so this anticipation that Zephaniah records is a day when the king of Israel, Yahweh himself, dwells in the midst of his people, exalting over them with joy, quieting them in his love, and rejoicing over them with shouts of joy. He is shouting, expressing joy in song over his people, in his people, the king, Jesus himself, singing praises to God amidst the congregation. And it will be so marvelous that we will be left speechless, breathless, at points, at times. How does that work out with us two shouting with joy and him shouting with joy and him singing and us being speechless and him, us singing with him? I don't know, but we'll have a long time to stop and be awestruck and then keep singing and then pick up again in song with Jesus. Jesus, the king, will be the one we worship and he will be the worship leader in heaven leading his people to worship God forever. This will happen in the kingdom. Uh, What John later Details is a thousand years of perfect peace where King Jesus has established his rule and reign on earth. And that kingdom, as predicted by the prophets, as told to David, his seed will reign on his throne. But that kingdom will have no end. No end. That thousand year period being described by Zephaniah, will extend on into eternity into a new heavens and a new earth and a new Jerusalem. This is what we'll be doing for all of eternity. Never bored, always exalting, always at peace, always with tremendous joy. This Character of their God is one, he is one who is mighty to save, abundant in joy, and even awesome in love. And then finally, the final feat facilitating fervent felicity is number five, the gathering of God's people. The gathering of God's people, verses 18 through 20. I will gather those who grieve about the appointed feast. They came from you, O Zion. Uh, reproach is a burden to them, literally. Uh, This anticipates those who were eager to celebrate, uh, worship God as he had ordained, and either due to exile or either due to the injustice in Israel, a priesthood that refused to function properly, judges that refused to function properly, kings that refused refused to rule rightly. These feasts were not carried out as they were anticipated or as they were uh, ordained. And so one day, these people who grieved over those injustices, grieved about the improper worship, would one day be gathered. And just notice at that time, verse 19, what else is true? Behold, at that time, I am going to deal at that time with all your oppressors. 
This is, again, verse 20, the same phrase at that time is used. This is your indication that it's the same period of time, it's the same day that Zephaniah has been prophesying about. This is still on the day of the Lord. So this is why we've said there's uh, universal destruction coming on the day of the Lord, but following that universal destruction is unparalleled blessing. This is the unparalleled blessing of the day of the Lord. Same era, same period of time that's in view. And when this gathering happened, it would be at the time when God dealt with all of their oppressors. Verse 19 says, he would save, I will save the lame. I will gather, again, gather the outcast, and I will turn their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. So this gathering of God's people, when he finally unites his people under his reign, to dwell among them as their king who has subdued finally every enemy that exists, then he would do it for these purposes, for glory and renown or praise and renown. Those terms, that's literally glory and a name. As the king is glorified by his people, as he is glorified amongst his people, He would even bring them together for the same purpose, to be glorious. They would have praise. They would have renown. And this is noticed not just in Israel, not just among those who are God's people, but all the earth, not just within the boundaries of the land, in other words, but this would be across all the earth. Verse 20 says, again, at that time, I will bring you in. Even at that time when I gather you together, indeed, I will give you these two things, renown or a name and praise among all the peoples of the earth. When I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says Yahweh. So one day, God's people, Israel, would actually possess what they came so close to at some times in their history, right? The nation's Scripture records streamed in to see the wisdom of Solomon, and most notably, the Queen of Sheba was left awestruck at his wisdom, at his riches, at the way he had wisely ordered his kingdom, at everything he had accomplished. Uh, You know, you go to Israel and you see some of these ancient ruins that exist, and, and it's no wonder that Solomon, who wisely brought the nation to its, to its peak, the, the peak of its glory, people would see it and be left awestruck. Well, one day there'd be a similar day, a greater day than even Solomon's when this would be true. And Israel, the nations would be able to look in and Israel would be exalted among the nations. Uh, even in the kingdom, this will be the case. There is a name given to Israel and there's particular praise given to God's people, Israel. And if you are a Gentile, like most of us, almost all of us probably are, we have no problem with that. Uh, There was one point on the trip, uh, I think Steve Kovac asked me, "What what do you think you might live in the land? Where would you like to live? And I thought, as long as I get in, I don't care. (laughs) Anywhere, right? So even Gentiles, and Zechariah 8 talks about this, when they will grab hold of a Jew and say, take me to your God. This renown, this praise will characterize Israel, the rest of the earth, as they look in and see the glory and the name that Israel has been given, will be glad and even rejoice in that day. And just notice at the end of of 20, among all the peoples of the earth, this happens. And what else happens? You have a, a time marker. When, when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says Yahweh. 
So there are fortunes. Remember what God promised Abraham? Uh, that he would bless him and make his name great? On the heels of those blessings in chapter 12 and then in chapter 15, what you see recorded about Abraham, if you carefully just read through those passages, on the heels of the promise initially given and then repeated, particular notice from Moses' writing is given to the riches that Abraham ends up amassing on the heels of those promises. It's not to say that the ultimate the, the promises have been fulfilled, but God is including among the, the spiritual blessings, physical blessings, tangible uh, blessings in wealth to Abraham. Even the, the land that's in subsequent times yield tangible blessings. And Solomon records that in Proverbs 3, that if you embrace wisdom then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. Right? These were things that were promised to Israel if they would finally and, and only obey, which they never actually did. So what, what happened? The land is barren. It doesn't produce like it's supposed to because Israel refuses to submit to her king, refuses to be obedient. Well, one day these fortunes would be given to Israel the land would yield like it's supposed to. The wealth that would be the inevitable result of a plentiful, uh, abundant production of everything that the, is found in the land, this would actually be the case. Why is this not the prosperity gospel? Well, the prosperity gospel promises you tangible blessings, riches, and wealth in this life. And nobody who is just using God and doesn't actually love God, but only loves the things that God gives, they would not be pleased. They would not be satisfied for blessings coming in another life, in this life, in restored fortunes, if you will. Nobody's going to humble themselves under the rule and reign of God for this kind of delayed gratification. And so God, with no restraint on the, on the language here, can promise future fortunes for those who would actually do the impossible and humbly trust God in this life here and now, who, according to verse 3 of chapter 2, would seek Yahweh in this life, would be humble in this life, would seek righteousness and seek humility in this life because they believe God. Fortunes, future fortunes, can be promised to those people Because that is impossible. No one on their own strength, no one who puts confidence in the flesh would would see this day of future fortunes. And so this day is in anticipation. This is the day that's promised. And again, the book ends similar to the way that it started with a reference to the word of God. Says Yahweh. You remember how it started? Chapter 1, verse 1. The word of Yahweh which came to Zephaniah. Begins with the word of Yahweh, ends with what God says. When the word of God speaks, God is speaking. And so thinking about everything that we've heard from this prophecy, do you just ask yourself, do you believe this? Do you trust the Lord with all of your heart so that when he speaks, your heart says, amen, says yes to God? I believe that. Do you believe that wrath is coming? Unbearable, unseen wrath is coming on this world one day. And that in order to escape that wrath, you must humble yourself before God. You must seek him in this life. And if you do, are you, are you believing God? Are you waiting on that rescue? You will not see the wrath that is coming. You've been rescued from it. You will be rescued from it. Even if what it takes, if you die before the wrath comes, God will resurrect you 
and rescue you from that wrath. That is coming. Do you believe that? And then when that wrath is passed, when all of God's judgments have been taken away, are you living in this life anticipating what's to follow? A kingdom to come. A king who is reigning. Do you long to see Jesus exercise his perfect rule, all of the authority that's been given to him on heaven, on earth, exercised powerfully here with no enemies in sight and Israel finally given the promises that have been foretold? Do you long for that day? And does all of that anticipation, like it will produce tremendous joy in the future, does that produce tremendous joy today? That is a fruit of the Spirit. If the Spirit is producing, working faith in your heart, then these promises that are the grounds of this joy can't help but make you rejoice in this, in this day, today. If you lack joy, if you find yourself in a season even of depression or doubt, then just call these truths to mind. By faith, lay hold of these promises that are coming in the future and watch God work joy in your heart even amongst difficult situations. Maybe you're in the midst of a trial. These are still things to rejoice over. And so before God changes your circumstance, if you're in a trial or before he changes your circumstance and brings the kingdom like he one day will, we can still have joy because of these future realities. And we can help each other believe these things by getting better at articulating these truths for each other. We can encourage one another. We can comfort one another with these words. Amen? Let's pray. God, thank you so much for these truths. These are astonishing truths that we would have no access to. We would not know about them. We would not believe them. They truly are too good to be true, except that you've said them. And so help us, God, believe them. Help us to rejoice over them, even as you uh, have seen fit to, to take joy over your people, that, Jesus, you are not ashamed to call us your brothers, to receive us as a gift from your Father. Unbelievable, God, except that you've said it and they are worthy of being believed. I pray for, uh, for Grace Bible Church, all of us hearing these words, that you would help us to see this day, that we would long to see your kingdom come. We even pray, Lord, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is already in heaven. Make your reign evident. Make it tangible here. We pray, and we pray, Lord Jesus, come, even come quickly. Rescue us, bring your wrath, save your people. We pray in your name, Jesus, amen.